Good morning traders and happy new year. Uh, today is January 2nd and in today's video we'll be going over something for the Forex traders particularly. Now in terms of actually trading a market, I think Forex is one of the hardest markets to trade. I think uh, trading equities, whether that's straight stocks or, or options, is much easier than trading Forex. It's, it's also more complicated than trading Forex, however. Uh, now, just because something's difficult doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. I think there are a tremendous amount of opportunities available in the Forex market every single week if you know how to go about finding them. So the methodology that we use here is consistent across all markets. You know, we're predominantly and primarily Elliotticians, but there are some wrinkles with the Forex market that makes the application of Elliot a little bit more interesting than say in stocks. So where am I going with this? Where I'm going with this is that don't feel pressured to have to trade Forex because it's the first market you were exposed to, or it's perhaps the one where you've spent most of your time as a trader. Uh, my real introduction to trading was in the FX markets. I shortly thereafter came across stocks and options and fell in love with those as well. I'm now truly a multi-asset class trader. You know, I'll trade everything from stocks to crypto, commodities, FX, um, bonds, <laughs> you name it. And Forex will always hold a special place in my heart. And one of the reasons for that is because its behavior as an asset class is a little bit unique. Uh, I, mean, I guess every asset class is unique, but what makes FX particularly interesting is that we're always selling one currency in order to buy another, right? We're always basically long and short at the same time. And that has result, that, that process results in this phenomenon called stationarity, statistical stationarity. And, and that's where we tend to have currencies trading within large ranges. So here you can see we're looking at the New Zealand dollar, US dollar currency pair. Uh, now this data only goes back to 2008. So if I pull up some of the ICE data, which goes back much further and we'll go to Kiwi dollar now, you'll see that yes, we did have a large trend uh, establish itself you know, in the early 70s and then we bottomed out in 2000. But look, even what happened here between 85 and 2000, one giant range. And, and we in fact tagged the top of that range in 2005, exceeded a little bit in 07, gave back a lot of those gains. And guess what? We've been in a range for a long time since. And the Kiwi is like one of the more volatile currencies, right? If, if we look at something like uh, Euro Sterling, for example, we'll see an interesting theme take place here as well. So going back to the late 80s, we can see that the Euro has over time um, appreciated relative to the pound, but it's a very choppy movement. Now, if I showed you a chart of something like, let's say, uh, NVIDIA, I mean, like, geez, th this is exponential growth, literally, right? This is what makes trading stocks so much easier, in my opinion. But the entries and the techniques that you use trading stocks is very different from how you would trade FX, especially if you are an options trader. I'm not going to get into all those intricacies now. I really want to focus on FX because this is, this is really for you guys, my FX traders. Uh, all right, so we're going to be taking a look at the New Zealand dollar, US dollar, okay? Now, from an Elliott Wave perspective, okay, I'm just going to slap some labels on this thing. We can see very clearly a five wave advance that is likely over, and we all know what comes after a five wave advance. We're going to get a three wave corrective setback, you know, A, B, C. Um, all right, so the question for me it, as an Elliottician is it, not whether I can count fives and threes. Counting a market is really, really easy. Um, what's far more difficult is being able to balance the probabilities in terms of what is a good primary count and what's a good alt count. And then of course, how to take advantage of these different counts. All right. So FX is the deepest market on the planet. That doesn't mean that all currency pairs are far more liquid than some other markets. Uh, so for example, if we're looking at a currency pair, like the New Zealand dollar, Canadian dollar cross, that's not a very liquid currency pair, but New Zealand dollar, because um, one leg of that trade involves the dollar is fairly liquid. Okay, it takes a lot of energy 
to move a liquid market around. It's because there's so many competing orders in the marketplace, so many buys and sells. There has to be a significant order imbalance in order for the market to be able to run a significant distance. All right, this is where supply and demand theory from a technical standpoint comes into play. And it's where I like to balance concepts like Wyckoff along with Elliott Wave theory, right? One thing I've noticed over the last couple of years is the emergence of Wyckoff. And of course, there's nothing new under the sun. And what I've seen in a lot of Reddit uh, channels, social media channels, is that Wyckoff's just been repackaged as um, SMC. You might have heard of, heard of it called uh, Smart Money Concepts. So it's, it's a great marketing name, uh, Smart Money Concepts. No one wants to be DMC, Dumb Money Concepts. We all want to be smart, right? Well, uh, what it really is, is a rehash of, of Wyckoff in, in, in many ways. Now, I'm not going to dive into the ins and outs of Wyckoff theory, but I'm going to explain to you the concepts behind what these SMC traders are talking about and why there actually is a nugget of value there, especially when you pair it with Elliott Wave, with the Elliott Wave model. All right. So I, I, for the record, I think all technical analysis is subsumed by the Elliott Wave model. In, in other words, Elliott can explain everything, whereas there is no other market methodology out there that can explain the minutia of market movements the way Elliott does. But that doesn't mean that the concepts from these other schools of analysis are useless. They're in fact very valuable. Okay, so when we look at Elliott Wave theory, a mistake that I see a lot of Elliotticians make is that they they get so engrossed in the details, the rules, and not to say that you shouldn't ignore the rules and guidelines, but they prioritize the rules and guidelines above all else and start forgetting about very basic technical analysis. So for example, if I measure the Fibonacci relationship between waves one and three here, we can see that we nearly reach 161.8%, which is a very common guideline for third waves. And we can see that wave two is steep and wave four is shallow, relatively speaking. And we can see that waves one and five are relatively similar in length. So here we're observing a lot of the, the you know, general guidelines that make um, a wave count so compelling. And you can see here waves one and wave five, roughly similar in length, wave five is a little bit longer. So now what an Elliottician would say is, well, I expect wave two to be at least a 61.8% retracement of wave one. That is the most common objective for a second wave. So that would take us to roughly around the 60 cent handle. Okay, so here is where supply and demand theory comes into play here and why you can use this uh, as not just a filter, but perhaps as another way of understanding market context in the search for better or more frequent opportunities if that's what you're into. Okay, so if I'm looking here, we can see that we have highs, uh, two, three important swing highs here. All right, now I'll just draw horizontal ray lines over them so you can see the swing highs. Okay, so we have two lines. This first line here intersects two swing highs and then we have a swing high up here, okay. So this is where Wyckoff, supply demand theory, whatever you wanna call it, comes into play. Whenever you have a swing high, so if we go back here to this first swing high, that was established in at the beginning of April of 2023, we can see that the market traded lower. In other words, there are people that are short the Kiwi dollar and long the US dollar. Where do you think people always place a stop? It's almost always above or below a swing point. So there are stop losses clustered here above these swing points. There's stop losses clustered above here. Now these are people that are short, okay? There's stop losses here. We're on a daily chart. It's very obvious even on a daily chart where these stop losses are. And every time people on the short side of the market get stopped out, guess what? They have to close their short positions, which means they're buying back their short positions. And that is fuel that is going to send the market higher and higher and higher. All right, so think about it this way. This is very common sense. Do you wanna sell an asset when, um, let, let's say, okay, actually you using the other side being long a market makes a little bit more sense from a common sense perspective here. Let's say I buy a stock at $40 and it goes up to 45. Do I wanna sell it for a $5 profit? Yes. 
Sure, it's not bad. But if in the past, I, that same stock has traded as high as $100, and I think there's a reasonable chance we could go up to $100, wouldn't I want to sell at $100? In other words, if I buy at a certain price, I want to be able to sell higher. If I'm selling at a certain price, I want to be able to buy my orders back at a lower price. Um, so what this means effectively, right, is that we are creating a larger amount of supply for the New Zealand dollar, the higher and higher we go. We get to this tipping point here at 63.82. And at this point, the market doesn't believe that we can go any higher. All right. So all those people that were short, they got stopped out. You can see we have a little high here on this candle taking out that swing point. A bunch of shorts got stopped out. Now we're at a good area of relative value. Relative value because currencies are traded in pairs. It's very difficult to say in isolation what something is worth. For example, if I gave you um, Ford, what is Ford stock worth? All right, well, it's one um, answer is, is it's worth whatever the market says it's worth, sure. But how can you convince me or give me a rational argument that the stock should be worth X? Well, people go through all sorts of mental gymnastics using fundamental analysis to, to be able to give what is quote unquote, a fair market value. But ultimately, right, it's very difficult. What is a Ford stock? How do we quantify that? We'd have to go through the entire company's assets, discount their future cash uh, flow and, and, and try to value the company based on, on what we think it's going to do in the future. It's a very difficult exercise to do. But when you have two things that are relatively common, I mean, New Zealand dollar, the US dollar, they're both currencies. Right now, it's much easier to determine relative value between two currencies. And that's why we see so much range bound action in the Forex market. OK, so in any case, the point I'm trying to make here is that regardless of the wave count, it's likely we're going to encounter resistance along these swing points. And the higher the swing point is, the more valuable it is and the more likely it's going to be defended. So you can see we didn't even approach the swing point, at least not yet. That's where the Elliott comes in based on the long term wave count. Uh, we might be able to build a thesis as to whether or not we're going to take this out. But as of right now, what we can say is we did spike up above here, but clearly everyone that was short from a higher level felt threatened enough to step in and defend their position. And what happened? We went back to another area of relative value. There was a swing low here. In other words, near this area, there was demand for the New Zealand dollar. There was demand for the New Zealand dollar. Okay. And so we poked below here. All right. We created a reversal structure, a five wave structure here, followed by a zigzag, followed by another five wave structure, followed by another three wave structure, five wave structure, three wave structure, five wave structure. Right. This is classic Elliott. All right. But the important Thing, the point of this video is to identify the areas of value where you believe there is going to be a balance in orders followed by an imbalance in orders. All right, so let's think about that. If I'm a sprinter and I'm running, 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 and I want to start running the other way back, what happens? For me to start running back, I first need to come to a stop. Now that stop can be very short. I can pivot on the ball of my foot and very smoothly start running in the other direction. Or I could take a breather. I can pace, walk in a circle with my hands on my hips, catch my breath, and then slowly start jogging back. All right. So sometimes the market is going to pivot on a dime like it did here. And sometimes the market is going to walk around for a bit after sprinting and catch its breath. All right. When, when the market's catching its breath, it's much easier to position yourself. No doubt about it, the patterns are more clear, all right? But there are ways to get involved in the market also when it turns on a dime. We cover that in our trading course. Of course we do. Um, the point here is not identifying which Elliott Wave patterns we want to trade. It's knowing where to look for them in the first place. So we can use a combination of different technical tools, Fibonacci. The mathematical principle for all financial markets plays a very important role. So for example, here, once we have wave three identified, we can see that this is where wave one and wave five are equal, a very common 
objective for fifth waves. And guess what? That also happens to coincide with a previous area of value. In other words, there is supply, overhead supply of the New Zealand dollar, and we can now start looking for trades to position ourselves on the short side. So this is on a daily time frame. This is where the fractal nature of the market comes into play, and you start looking for your opportunities on the lower time frames if you can't identify them on the higher time frames. So whether that's a one hour chart, a 15 minute chart, five minute chart, it doesn't really matter, okay? What matters is that you're able to identify the pattern where it is most clear, okay? So if that's on a five minute chart, that's fantastic. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? There is no right or wrong answer. On the five minute chart, for example, we can see very clearly and here we have a wave one, we have a wave two, we have a wave three, we have a wave four, ending diagonal for wave five. Um, and then we have a three wave movement here, another impulsive movement down, A, B, C. All right, so now we have a three wave movement down. That's either wave A of a flat or it's uh, wave W of a much larger sequence, zigzag, the double zigzag. And then here we have potentially another three wave movement complete, uh, or we could have a three wave movement up, a three wave movement down, one, two, three, four, five, wave C, a truncated wave C for a running flat, followed by another five wave movement down, okay? So we can start chaining these patterns together. We can start looking for entry opportunities. Every time there's a three wave movement um, and you're confident you can count that three wave movement, you have a potential trading opportunity. Now that doesn't mean you should count every or you should trade every three wave movement you see. There's a difference between being able to count something and thinking it's a good idea to trade it, right? So I like, for instance, personally, I didn't really see any reason to get involved with this market until very early this morning. We have a clear corrective structure, A, B, C, D, and E. Now, are there alternate counts? Is it possible that you know, this is the entirety of the three wave movement. This is a wave one, this is a wave two, this is a wave three, four, and five, sure. But I thought the triangle counted pretty good. So by the time I was at my charts, you know, around early half past five in the morning, I can see the structure that's taken place based on the work I did on the higher time frame first, and now I can get involved. Now, if I'm trading on the five minute time frame, it's not like I'm looking to score um, I'm not trying to win the lottery. I'm just trying to get in and out. You know, I, I didn't even get out anywhere near these lows. I got out about an hour later, somewhere around these lows here. Was it a fantastic trade that's gonna set me up for life? No, but it was a good trade. It was in and out, and it was using the criteria, you know, that we cover in our educational materials. But in, anyway, I don't wanna focus on entries. I wanna focus on this concept of finding and looking for value in certain areas, marrying that with an Elliott wave count, right? So we can see the same thing here. One, two, three, four, five. Where did we top out? Near prior swing points. So we can see here, there's a swing, there's a swing low here, a swing high here, there's a swing high here as well, right? This swing high, is more valuable than this swing high. So while this one got taken out, this one remained intact. And this swing high is more valuable than this swing high. And on and on we go. It's just common sense, all right? The higher a swing point is, the more quote unquote valuable it becomes. That, that just because something valuable doesn't mean that the liquidity that's there isn't going to be tapped, right? That's where the Elliott wave model comes into play. Uh, if we count five waves, we count five waves. If we count three waves, we count three waves, for instance, right? And obviously where Elliott gets complicated is with the myriad corrective structures that we have available. Uh, so in any case, I hope this video was helpful and gave you a little bit better of an understanding in terms of how to work with the Elliott wave model and apply some very classical concepts of technical analysis at the same time.